Welcome to Hiraith, the home of modern Welsh politics. Football is inherently political. It can teach us about class solidarity, LGBT, UIA rights, race relations, the gender pay gap and the nature of global finance. And it can also tell us about the building of a modern nation. To discuss the impact the independent football nation has on national identity and Wales's international reputation, as well as Wales' chances in the upcoming European Championships, we have Martin Johns, historian and author among, of, among many other books, A History of Sport in Wales. Hello, Martin. Good evening. Uh, we have Richard Roberts, novelist, author of Hello, Friend, We Missed You, and co-host of Podcast Pell Droid. Hello, Richard. Hello. Uh, and we've got Megan Faringa, who is an American writer who focuses on all, all things Welsh football. Hello, Megan. Hi, guys. Nice to be here. Well, thank you very much to all of you for coming. So a few months ago, we had uh, former First Minister Carwin Jones on the podcast talking about his career. But one of the things he did say was that without devolution, he wasn't sure that Wales would really exist. And my thought at the time, although it wasn't particularly relevant, was, well, what about our other national institutions, such as our sports teams? And I wanted to start really by asking, so how important do you think that the Welsh international teams, and especially in this case, the football team, are to a sense of a Welsh national identity that is distinct from a British identity in Wales. Do you want to start us off, Martin? Yeah, I mean, I slightly disagree with our former First Minister there that Wales wouldn't exist. I mean, Wales has been around for a thousand odd years and devolution has only been around for 20 odd. So um, Wales has proved itself very resilient as a sense of identity. But nonetheless, if you look at the last 200 years, it has this survived against the odds in many ways you know in in the modern era where the power of the British economy the power of the British state the power of the English language you know undoubtedly that has eroded a sense of Welsh distinctiveness if you like you know the sense that kind of Welsh culture is different and in that period I think sport has been really important in not just reminding people outside Wales that Wales exists but also reminding the Welsh themselves. I mean, I mean, sport's really powerful because it doesn't require anything of us to support a team. So, you know, in a nation that is divided by region, by class, by language, you can just support the Welsh team. And it doesn't matter whether we're talking about football, rugby or other sports. And it's symbolic, you know, there's the dragon, the team is called Wales, we play the national anthem before the game. It provides us with stories and memories. It's exciting. It's attractive. It brings people in. So I think sport has been a really powerful kind of emotional thing that has told us and told the rest of the world that Wales is different. That was historical accident. Um, you know, nobody yet set up to set up national teams here to tell the world that Wales was a nation. But that has been the impact on it. So. Wales would still exist without without sport, but nonetheless, I think sport has been really important in ensuring that Welsh identity is as strong as it is. It's really interesting. The kind of example that came to mind as Martin was talking was cricket. Now, there is like the England and Wales cricket board. There's nothing remotely Welsh about the England cricket team in any way, shape or form. Um, so in that sense, without a national team, Wales doesn't exist in the world of cricket in that in that part of the world of sport so yeah having a, a national football team is incredibly incredibly important to our nationality especially when you consider the kind of the hostility even within the welsh media towards the welsh football team there was i mean i won't say the name of the the journalists or the place where they publish their work but they tried to cancel the welsh football team not all that long ago, not all that long before the Euros, suggesting that it would be better if we amalgamated with England so Welsh people could play international football in big tournaments. Now, of course, that sounds ridiculous and ludicrous, and these people should be really embarrassed by what they said. But to me, yeah, it's, it's a, a sport is a massive part of any nation's identity, and Wales as a nation is no different. Megan, as someone who's moved to Wales, how important has football been to you in order to sort of feel this tangible sense of, of, of a different national identity between Wales and the rest of the UK? Well, the two go hand in hand for me. I would not know the Welsh football team if it hadn't have been for the Welsh football fans for independence and vice versa. I remember being on the plane coming over from the USA to Wales. And the only thing I knew about Wales was that in Euro 2016, a dude named Gareth Bale took to a pitch 
and did some crazy stuff. That's, that's genuinely all I knew about it. And there's a man named Dai sitting next to me and he was trying to explain some other aspects of it, trying to explain to me the team. And that was the first real thing I knew about Wales. And then I moved over here. I remember being on Woman B, going to that game in Cardiff, the hungry qualifier, the final one that sort of like nailed us into what we're going to be taking on tomorrow. And I'd just never seen anything like it before. People were so proud to, you know, boast the Wales dragon on their backs and the flags. They all look like superheroes wearing it. But for me, that was when I actually felt like I was in another country and in another place. I remember I called my parents immediately. And I said, I never want to leave this place because I feel like I've actually found a new home. Like I've, I've traveled, I've, I've been, I've lived in a ton of different places, but I've never felt like I truly lived in another world until I moved here. I got to know the football team and then kind of saw the connection between the two. So yeah, for me, the two go hand in hand. They're, they're inseparable at this point. Rich, how would you think that sense of identity has changed? You know, how long has there been this emphasis on the independent football nation? And how, you know, that compares with so many of our other national teams. You mentioned cricket before, but you wouldn't get that. Yeah, there's not, there doesn't feel to be this sense of Welshness in the same tangible way with things like. I remember kind of back in the days of, you know, I guess the, the dark days, um, but we moved back where we, we left the Millennium Stadium, crowds were extremely low. But what you had was almost like a fresh kind of, start of just a hardcore group of fans who would build the culture up almost from nothing. Whereas in something like rugby, the culture is highly establishment in the main. It's like established from over like a very, very long period of time. And that kind of culture normally isn't kind of where you would look for like a counter movement. Whereas in the football, it kind of, it, it began in those days of kind of like eight, 9,000 people, the chance of Welsh, not British, often throughout the game. And then of course that develops to our most popular and most sung chant now, uh, Viva Gareth Bale, said he had a bad back, F the Union Jack, which is a super, it's an incredibly witty, funny, but highly political. And um, there's, there's a real truth to the chant. And I think that's probably why it's our most popular. So yeah, like I guess in answer to your question, um, it was like a grassroots movement that at the same time wasn't elitist. It was super welcoming. I mean, if you go to kind of the Red Wall, the Canton stand, it's not just guys in their 20s and 30s it's like families it's, it's women it's, it's kind of um the people who sit near me it's a dad and his two daughters so it's like super inclusive and everyone kind of backing the team and also kind of just backing the notion of why it's important we have the team I feel I mean it, sorry if you ask a historian a question it's hard not to give a history lesson but you know if, if you look at the long-term history of Welsh football it has been very unionist you know, in the 20s and the 30s, when the FAW didn't want to know FIFA, the FA wasn't interested. So the FAW just slavishly followed the FA's line. And what that meant was that we were invited to the 30, the 34 and the 38 World Cup and said no, because if England weren't going, then we weren't going to go as well. In 1966, when England win the World Cup, the Western Mail is running an editorial saying this is a British moment of glory, that this belongs to British football there are shows and, and kind of carnivals across Wales that, that, that day that all see their attendances plummet because Welsh people want to stay at home and watch the, FA, the World Cup final. So, you know, traditionally, Welsh football has been very British in many ways, but something changes in the 70s. Um, and at the same, that's partly inspired by rugby, I think. You know, when, when Wales has a rugby team that's, that's really kind of world class and quite aggressive in its Welshness. And you see it creeping into Welsh fan culture in, in, in international football in, in the 70s, booing God Save the Queen, because they used to play God Save the Queen and Him Lad Benadai for home internationals, because the FAW wanted to play both national anthems. And the Welsh fans start booing God Save the Queen. Um, you get far more aggressive chanting um, about England starting to come into football. And amongst the kind of the hardcore fans, and I don't think they represent football fans in general in Wales, but against the hardcore people who are following the national team from the 70s onwards, really, there's been this kind of Welsh, not British attitude about it. It doesn't represent Wales as a whole, but it's been really strong. Yeah, for me, what was interesting was the us versus them mentality that I got that I got to kind of know when I was watching the games and getting to meet a lot of the fans. I think the first thing that I learned when I'd gotten to go to Woman Be Street was I'm... Um, as one of them had said, well, if we can do it on the pitch, why can't we do it in this place, this place or this place? You know, why, why can't we take what we do there and put it into other aspects of our lives? And it sounded so simple. It sounded almost childish to me. I was like, well, yeah, of course. Like, why isn't that a thing? And then 
you think about it, it's so much deeper than that. There's a lot of other instrumental things that have to go along with it, but at its core, it is such a simple concept. Like if you get on the pitch, why can't you do it somewhere else? And it's so easy to get behind that. I think that is why the sport and identity is so important because it is so simple, but once it clicks, then it does sort of just make sense in people's minds. So yeah, I, it's been very fun to kind of see that grow and, and manifest over the last year and a half I've been here. Richard, to what extent do you think that this sort of growing success and growing Welshness of the football team has contributed to the rise in support for things like independence we've seen in Wales? Well, I think the two kind of feed um, feed off each other, really. I mean, I know kind of personally, a lot of people have come around to the idea of, well, a lot of people have come around to the the idea of Welsh independence through their support for the Welsh national football team. And I guess a lot of people who were into Welsh independence have found themselves maybe leaning a little bit away from rugby and the kind of associated kind of establishment culture and more, more into supporting football. I mean, I, I know quite a few people who, who have kind of gone on that journey. Yeah, they, they play into each other. And it's like an, an ongoing and ever increasing, I would say quite clearly unstoppable kind of kind of journey. I mean, it's begun and there is an end destination and that is independence. I mean, I don't think anything in history is inevitable. So it certainly looks we're heading in that direction. But, I, you know, I don't think it's going to happen next year or next decade or anything. Um, they do, but I totally agree with Richard that they feed into each other. And, you know, football is political and football should be political. And just as kind of success on the pitch has made people think about, um, you know, to politics and kind of broader issues. And that, that is a bit of a change because I think sometimes in the past, sport is almost like compensated for other things. And we've put all our kind of our national energy and our national passion into sport. You know, people, people in Scotland in the 80s used to use the phrase 90 minute patriots. The SNP accused the Scottish nation of being 90 minute patriots, that they, they cared about their nation for the game and then forgot about it. And there is something in that, I think, you know, when we look back over time. Um, that people have used sport as a way of saying, well, we know we're a nation, we've got a national team. And that's maybe distracted us from, from other battles and fighting inequality in particular. So something is changing. Absolutely, it's changing the football, it's changing in, in Welsh society. It's still a minority position, but something's happening and football is part of that story. One of the very interesting things that I've seen coming from the Welsh team's social accounts is that they have a commitment to putting out a lot of content in the Welsh language. How important do you think that is to the growth of the Welsh language and the, and the ability to sort of permeate into broader society of the language? And there's also, there was a really interesting article written today by Ellis James in The Guardian about Wales away being the sort of bilingual counterculture. To what extent do you think these things have contributed to, to more people embracing the language? Yeah, I think it's really nice. I think the FAW, um, there's a lot of really, really, really good people. Um, I mean, I guess like historically, you look at the FAW and they were always kind of constantly being trashed for like unprofessionalism, being stuck, stuck in the past. But over the last kind of decade or so, they've really kind of changed how they operate. And there's some great people that the thing that I really, really love is if you look at the FAW's social media or their kind of press releases, they always refer to the team as Cymru. You'll never see them really refer to it the team is Wales, even when they're writing in the English language, which is a really nice thing to do. So it's a kind of, they're not hammering people over the head with anything. They're just, it's a fluid kind of bilingual culture at the FAW. And I think that's fantastic. And Ellis James is, is probably is probably right about that. It's, it's, it's lovely to see. And I think people, even people who either aren't fluent Welsh speakers or people who, who don't speak Welsh yet, they like it. And it is kind of, it's a nice inclusive kind of feel. Megan, has it inspired you to learn more Welsh? Uh, it actually has. Um, my my boyfriend and a few of my other friends, whenever we go for walks or anything like that, they'll they'll sort of tell me, oh, read that sign, read that sign and that kind of thing. So I definitely have but like with the press conferences um, or the like the press releases or anything that the FAW send out. I do notice that they send they always send a Welsh version, an English version. They always refer to this team as Cymru. And I've even found myself referring to him in that way. So it's been very cool in that aspect. Anything that we do on our site, we really do try to stress some sort of Welsh language aspect to it. If it's someone's birthday, we usually try to use some parts of the Welsh language. So it's been really cool for me to learn that because language is so important to an identity as well. And, 
you know, if you lose a language, you do lose an aspect of an identity. So I, I find it extremely cool that the football team has kind of embraced it in that way. And I think it's going to inspire another generation to sort of get behind it. Cause when I first moved here, I know that there was like kind of two camps, one saying, Oh, it's dead. There's no work. There's no use in trying to like revive it. And another camp that was saying, no, no, we need to revive it. And I think the football team has kind of come in and said, you know, we need to support the language. And I think there's a lot of power in that. Mine is this, is this Cymru team more Cymraeg than others? I think the important point is what Richard said, that it, it, it's almost like they've naturalised it. They're not making a big deal of it, they're just doing it. And that, that's won over a lot of fans um, because it's, you know, it's, it's, it's just saying Welsh, the Welsh language is, is a normal part of our culture. We don't need to kind of make a song and dance a bit. We just use it without, without making a song and dance about it. What does worry me a little bit, and this isn't the FAW's fault at all, but it, in many ways it, it reflects a wider problem in Welsh society. As bilingualism has grown in public life, signs, forms, the language continues to get weaker as a community language. And I think sometimes the fact that Welsh is all around us has distracted us from what's really an economic battle to protect the language in, in the heartlands in the West, where, you know, whatever statistics say about rising numbers of speakers overall in Wales, in the Welsh speaking communities in the West, the language is in trouble and no, no amount of tweeting in Welsh by the FAW or any other public body in Wales is going to change that. But that's not the FAW's fault. Do you think this is something that sport can play a part in, or do you think it has to be like government action that changes the um, amount of people speaking Welsh? Clearly, it's not something that sport is responsible for or can actually be the kind of the solution for. And I mean, I agree with what Martin was saying there, for sure. Really interesting to note, kind of, I guess, tangentially somewhat, but um, also relevant. I believe there's five members of the Welsh squad who are actually uh, first, well, uh, are bilingual and all Welsh speakers, which I think is the largest amount for an incredibly long time, which is which is just lovely to see. And it's kind of nice. You've got Aaron Ramsey kind of tweeting occasionally in Welsh and stuff like that. And I think Ben Cabango was on um, with his brother on S4C, Espedarek, um, last week talking, which, which is which is lovely to see. Um, so I think from like, in terms of like the young fans' point of view, if, you, if you're kind of someone who goes to a Welsh medium school and perhaps you don't speak it at home, to see your kind of like your footballing heroes speaking it, tweeting it, that is, of course, going to be a positive thing because I guess, I mean, the language hasn't always been seen as like the coolest thing to speak in for, for reasons outside of like our, our control as Welsh people mostly. So yeah, sport's got a part to play as it does, but I think ultimately it's a governmental level um, of course. Sport can be a catalyst, but I think the government does ultimately have sort of the, the bigger hand. But with the players who can speak Welsh, it's a lot of the younger ones who are starting to do the interview. So we'll go into the under 21s, do media sessions with them. And there's usually about 20 to 30 minutes that are given to just Welsh language interviews. And it's incredible the number of, of youngsters that are doing it. And most of them, like they're doing it for the first time. They're doing the first interviews in Welsh. You can see afterwards, they're a little nervous. They ask how they did. And it's really cool to kind of see them build on it. So Ruben Colwell's one, he's done, he did his first one with us, which was just incredible to think now he's in the Euros, but he did his first Welsh interview with us probably back in February, maybe early March for that first under 21s campaign that he was a part of um he was he was great I think he was actually more confident speaking in Welsh than he was speaking in English and the same thing for the seniors he was the exact same way so it's very cool but the youngsters are definitely embracing the Welsh language you know for a long time sort of Wales and Welsh football has been quite a divided place whether that was between sort of North and South Wales or Swansea and Cardiff City fans but you know the last few years you've seen mottos such as together stronger and the you know one of the older mottos we've got is got a quarae ki quarae to what extent do you think that football can act as some sort of social solidarity glue between between people in Wales? Do you think it has that ability? And do you think it is doing that? I think it has that ability, but I think there's also people that aren't going to take to it. I mean, just at the game, was it last weekend? There was a Swansea flag. People got upset about it. I mean, there's always going to be someone who doesn't agree with something or there's going to be some sort of line. But but yeah, I think sport has a way of unifying groups of people, no matter what it is. I'm from New Orleans. I remember when Hurricane Katrina hit my city. We had the world's worst 
American football team that could possibly have existed. We put brown paper bags over our heads when we went to games. We called ourselves the Aints instead of the Saints. I mean, it was horrible. And my city was really divided over it. But when the Saints ended up winning the Super Bowl in 2010, there were rumors going around that pigs were actually flying because it was just unreal that it happened. Our city got together. Like, I mean, there's still a mass amount of problems in New Orleans, but I had never seen my city sort of rally together and rally behind anything before. Um, so I do think sport has that potential, but ultimately it does, it can only do so much to paper over the cracks, if that makes any sense. I hope that wasn't too cynical. Not at all. Do we have any swans amongst the rest of the guests, by any chance? I, I am a Swansea City season ticket holder. Ah, what did you make of the... Um... The flag debacle last weekend. Um, I mean, when I started watching the Wales in the nineties, it wasn't comfortable. You know, there's no getting away from that. Going to Ninian Park, I remember being stuck in a traffic jam. My brother had a swan follow the swan stick on the back of his car, and the, uh, people surrounded our car and sort of banging on it. And it, you know, it was just, it, it was just uncomfortable. And that has disappeared. You know, and that has that has gone completely. So it was a bit surprising to see it come, sort of come back at, at last week's game. And I think that's part of about the move to Cardiff City Stadium because it doesn't have that history um, that Ninian Park used to used to do. And so I don't think it's it's as uncomfortable. But the culture has changed as well. And part of that is just doing well on the pitch. Because if you're doing well on the pitch, you're less arguing with each other. And, you know, the game last week was terrible. And maybe that was part of why fans were looking for other things to argue about. So I think the move to Cardiff City Stadium has been important. The together, stronger message has been important. But part, but a lot of it is just, you know, we've got a good entertaining team and, you know, we've got chances. And that takes people's attention off the petty rivalries between between Jacks and Cardiff. One thing I kind of notice from time to time, if you've had like the odd kind of comment, maybe there's quite a lot of self-policing amongst the fans as well. So And it always would be just like a one-off comment from someone and they would get told to shut up you know I think no one no one wants it no one wants any kind of rivalry going on like that amongst the fans and it's it's good to say that there isn't really any apart from the other occasion. Megan you mentioned earlier that when you you know the first time you really heard of Henry was you know Euro 2016 how important do you think competitions such as Euro 2016 and, and the strangely titled Euro 2020 are for Wales' sort of international recognition as a nation and sort of global reputation. Equally, how important is it that Wales is sort of invisible in other international competitions like the Olympics? I always thought that was kind of weird, actually, that when, so Euro 2016 happened, and my friends and I kind of got to know come here for the first time. And then I think it was the Olympics the next two, the two years later, and or whenever the Olympics were, I can't actually remember what it was, but I remember thinking it was it was a bit odd that we didn't see Wales. Um, we we couldn't really wrap our heads around it, and then you know we we got a history lesson, and we we're like, oh okay, that I, all right, that that's the way that it is. So it is it is a little bit weird, but it's uh, to me, I think being on the Euro stage is really really important in creating just a brand and creating a name for oneself. I mean, if to think about like just from like a, an American perspective, I think one of the reasons why the U.S. got so big internationally, like you can look at Michael Jordan, he created a brand just on his own. He went everywhere. Now people refer to being 23 as the Jordan year, that kind of thing. That's because he was such a global superstar. You got Gareth Bale doing kind of a similar thing with Wales now. But having that that stage to do it on is so, so important. And if you're not your own entity on that stage, then you can't possibly have that so I think it is uh, yeah it's immense yeah it's huge isn't it I think um I mean a lot of people felt like had we qualified for USA 94 that would have been the transformative moment for Welsh football and it would have put Wales on the map in a way it had never been before and I think that happened with um with the Euros it was it was an absolutely massive moment I mean I guess speaking personally um the fact that I've never, I mean, outside of like something as irrelevant as the Commonwealth Games, I've never seen like a Welsh athlete in the Olympics under the Welsh flag. I mean, it just makes for grim, kind of quite dour viewing, really. I mean, and I, I mean, I speak for kind of a lot of people, and you grew up who were kind of really athletic people who just didn't feel any connection to the people they were seeing, um, allegedly representing them in the British team. And there's no kind of reason why. Why there shouldn't why there shouldn't be really and it 
it, it poses like an awkward question, I think, for people who who will one moment kind of be supporting Wales, but then might turn around and say, oh, well, we shouldn't have a cricket team or we can't have an Olympic team. It's uncomfortable for them to try and kind of unpack why they're saying that, what it means about kind of their political allegiance or or their understanding of of identity and stuff. So for me, having a national sport team representing Wales is, I mean, there's, there's not many more examples I can think of that are more important to the identity of, of, of a person. I mean, that seems like quite a, quite a large statement, but I think it's kind of true. I mean, sport is huge. Mine, what do you think? Do you, do, you, do, you, do you think that Wales sort of gets forgotten about because of its lack of, say, the Olympic team? I mean, sport has been incredibly important, I think, in, um, you know, in giving Wales an international profile. And, I, you know, there's no, there's no doubt about that. I suppose if I wanted to be cynical, I'd say, why does that matter? And I think if you look at Welsh economic policy, for 40 odd years, it's been chasing external investment. And if you get foreign companies who invest here, they don't necessarily stay and really kind of the problem with our economy is has it been about chasing external investment rather than building from the bottom up. So I worry a little bit that placing a lot of emphasis on kind of soft power, as they, as, as they call it, the soft power of sport, that the goal of that is, is, is misguided economics. So undoubtedly sport matters in telling people Wales exists. But we, I should think we should think, well, why does it matter that people know Wales exist? And if it's about getting them to send their money here or spend some money on, you know, on, on tourism and supporting an industry that we've put too much emphasis on, I'd be, I'd be cynical about that. I agree. I remember when I was kind of doing my studies and stuff, that was one of the big things like soft power can only go so hard. It can only go so far. So it's, it's great to have that. It's great to have that name. But yeah, if, you, if the hard powers aren't really lifting you up in any sort of way, that foundation's not there. So it's, it's only going to go so far. And I think it's great. I think sport can be a catalyst, like I've said before, but ultimately there's got to be something else there. Sport can't do it alone. Rich, do you think that national identity and sport can ever be a bad combination? I think, you know, lots of people have got sort of used to the regular sight of international tournaments when you see conflict between fans of different nations not that Wales had too much of an issue with that when they were at Euro 2016 but do you think there is ever the potential for this you know international this this national fervor mixed with sport to be bad or dangerous yeah I mean clearly clearly there that there, there is but I guess from my perspective as a Welsh person like you say we've not been involved with it and I don't think it's incumbent on us to be worried about how other nations behave. I think for us, it's exclusively a good thing. So we should be focusing on that. I mean, I agree completely with what, um, what um, everyone is saying regarding um, too much emphasis on soft power. For me, the importance of getting Wales out there internationally through sport is the, is the kind of the cultural capital it gives to us Welsh people, especially young people. I mean. I don't know um, if you or anyone's ever experienced this, if you're abroad and particularly this happened when I was younger, I guess, and someone literally does not know where you're from. That's like, it's a bit embarrassing. It's quite humiliating. You have to end up basically saying you're from a country you're not from, in, namely England. And that's just simply not good for anyone's sense of self or, or, or of worth. So that kind of soft power for Welsh people, I think is incredibly important, but yes, quite correct. It's not that important outside of Wales for economic factors. Um, but just to go back initially to, to the question you asked, no, I don't think we as Welsh people should be worried. Other countries should be worried about it and that's on them to do that work. But for us, no, I, I don't think so. Mine, in terms of our history, has there ever been this problem in, in between you know for Welsh football fans maybe not for Welsh football fans and in 1969 there was what's called a football war where El Salvador and Honduras um, briefly went to war there were underlying tensions but the spark was rioting during a World Cup qualifier between the two countries so you know football has led to war at least on one occasion I think there is I don't want to knock England but when you it was clear at Euro 2016, you know, we were all having a party. We were having a great time. 
And I went to the fan park after the first game in Bordeaux. And there are all these England fans, you know, England were playing Russia, I think it was, singing, you know, about World War and kind of, you know, doing these kind of arms actions, pretending to be bombers. And the, the sense of Englishness that comes through for football is aggressive often amongst some fans. It is set up about a sense of superiority over other nations. So I don't think there's anything inherently inherent about football that encourages national tensions, but it can be used in, in a way to promote the wrong kinds of kind of national pride and, and, and patriotism, um, you know, and, and that's unfortunate. But we've been lucky in Wales that, we've, that we haven't experienced that. And in some ways, I think that has been a deliberate um, a deliberate attempt on many Welsh football fans to show we're not like the English, the English fight. You know, certainly you see that in Scotland, you know, huge efforts by the Tartan army, um, you know, in earlier World Cups when they were qualifying to behave differently, to show up the English. So, you know, football can go down the right, the wrong road and we shouldn't be complacent in Wales because, you know, these things can, can easily tip over. But so far, I think football has portrayed the right kind of nationalism and patriotism, a friendly patriotism that's not arrogant or doesn't think it's superior to other kinds, just gets on and has fun. Megan, what do you think? Do you think this national identity in sport can ever be a bad mix? Uh, I mean, it can. I always, anything can be bad if, if you know, there are bad apples. But with Wales, every time I mention a Welsh football fan or the idea of a Welsh football fan to anyone who's not Welsh, like I've, I have a few friends who are from France and I've, I think they were in Bordeaux when all this was happening and they had nothing but but compliments to talk about the Welsh fans that they had met. So clearly the Welsh put on like an incredible, they were, they were just great. They were great fans to be part of. And I know that a national, a national identity can sometimes come off as poor. I'm American. The number of times I've been told, wow, you're not what I expected of an American since moving over here has been, I could, I'd be a millionaire, honestly, for the number of times that it's happened. So I know that, that having that national identity and sort of changing it or having it be a good thing is like Richard said, like it's a, it's a nice sense of self. You know, it does suck sometimes coming from a place and having that identity already sort of thrust upon you. But if it's a good identity and you, it's something that Wales has clearly wanted to establish, I think they've done a really great job with it through the football fans. One thing I do want to get uh, your, your reactions to is what was your reaction to Boris Johnson failing to mention Wales this week when he was about to uh, wish success to all the all the teams from the UK taking part in the in the in in the Euros, um, you, you know, referred to us as the other home nations. Did everyone have any reaction to that when that happened? I think it sums up Welsh history. You know, we haven't been oppressed, but we've been out of sight and out of mind and neglected. And the fact you couldn't even remember we were there summed it up. I think it was the way he laughed at, like, as he was doing it. It just seemed so nonchalant. I think that that's what sort of got me. It was, yeah, it was the nonchalantness of, of the way he did it. Rich? Yeah, I, I loved it. I loved it. I mean, more. Keep doing it. Keep it coming. It's, it's, it's gravy. I mean, this is just just providing just more and more ammunition daily. It's um, brilliant. Do you think, like, do you think tangible entities like the company can provide a backstop to the political forces that want to weaken the influence of Wales as a political entity who want to see a more centralised British state? I mean, if, if again, sorry to go back to history again, but, you know, over the years, there have been numerous people who've saying, you know, the answer to Scottish nationalism is a British football team. But it's never people who understand football who's saying that. You know, you can't get rid of the fact we have four you know, four nations within the United Kingdom in, in, in football. But undoubtedly, you know, the, the whole dynamics of United Kingdom politics, cultural politics, you know, would be different, I think, if the single most popular sport, an emotive sport, we played as, we played as one, as one team. But you can't, you, you know, you can't change that. And for all the times people suggest that, you know, that, that they're ludicrous. If the one thing that would guarantee Welsh independence would be a political campaign to stop us having our own football and rugby team. Richard, how important are things like uh, say no to Team GB in terms of of, of this political uh, and making sure we are politically unique or, or separate at least from from the rest well, of the UK? Yeah, I think at the time when when the kind of say no to 
Team GB happened was around the, the Olympic squad. And this was prior, of course, to the Euros. And it was kind of prior as well to us becoming legitimately kind of a, a really, really good team. Um, and it was really, really important then, I think, because, I mean, an awful lot of people in, in FIFA, in UEFA, don't think it's correct that we have a team. And there probably is an argument that would say we shouldn't have a team. And this is, again, is the really uncomfortable thing for unionists when you say to them, oh, well, surely then Wales shouldn't have a rugby team. And I'll say rugby because it's always rugby fans. Then they get really defensive and kind of get a bit muddled in their words and don't know what to say. But yeah, I think like opposition to Team GB at the time was really important. It's less of an issue now because I think they've kind of accepted that they're not going to get anywhere. Certainly with the, the men's team, I know with the, the women playing, it was really interesting to hear Jess Fishlock talk about this. You could tell she was being incredibly careful with her words, how she was saying it. She was giving her support to Sophie Ingle, and it was heartfelt support. But she really kind of stopped short of saying she wanted the team like the team. She said she felt like she should have been picked, of course. And Jess probably should have been. She's a legend. She's incredible. But um, it was really kind of carefully worded. And it was quite clear she wasn't a fan of the team, of the concept, of the notion. And I mean, and it is quite absurd, really, um, because Team GB, no matter how good Wales is, and even Scotland, who were kind of on kind of a mini kind of upwards revival, it's predominantly always going to be English players. And you could conceivably say at times it would be 17 out of the 18 day match squad or whatever w- would be English um, from time to time historically. So yeah, opposition to Team GB is important and I think it's important to keep it up and not let it kind of creep in kind of through the back door um certainly I, I would never support or back team GP I and mean, that's a really obvious thing to say but you know, I'll, I'll just get it on record I remember the team GB stuff, stuff coming out with Sophie Ingle being in the squad and they um I think it was Sky who'd put up the the like starting 11 that they would choose and it was all English players and you, you had Sophie and it was, it felt like Sophie was almost like the token Welsh. It was like, it's okay guys. Like we are team G because we've got one Welsh player and that's totally fine and everything's great. And Sophie a hundred, hundred percent deserves to be there. She's an incredible midfielder, incredible defender. I wish I could just, just dribble the, like the ball at some capacity like her. I would be awesome. And I could finally beat my brother at football, but it was a little bit kind of just upsetting to see because it didn't, it didn't feel like a team GB. It felt like a team England with one Welsh player or one Irish player or one Scottish player. Um, so, yeah. And one of the things that I love most about football is sort of the tribalism around it. Like if you're a Leeds fan, you don't suddenly go, oh, you know what? Today, I really feel like being a Man United fan. Like you don't suddenly jump ship. And with the U.S., you, you can. you can. You can just you piggyback and you grab whatever team's currently winning. But the thing about football is that you grow up and you love a team and that's your team. That's your identity. And. I think a team GB sort of goes against that whole idea of, of, of tribalism and feeling like you're, you've got your team and that's you, that's, that's your people. Rich, if, if Wales could repeat their success from Euro 2016, what do you think the impact of that would be on the sort of national psyche of Wales? Well, I mean, I don't even think they need to repeat the success. I think barring kind of, an absolute disaster of like three terrible performances and three, you know, shocking results. I don't think we have to um, repeat getting to the round of four again. I think we could do, it's possible, but um, I think just a really solid, good showing. I mean, we play much better football now than we did in the previous team in, in the Euros. Like far, far more technical, far more like easy on the eye and appealing um, to watch. So I think just playing good games, hopefully winning, hopefully doing well, that in and of itself will be enough to kind of cement the legacy of, of 2016 and, and keep Welsh football on an upward curve. Because I think this team is far from finished. This, isn't, this won't be the end of this group of players for sure. I think we're only going to get stronger and we'll be looking good for the World Cup then. So I think it's more about just the continuation of the journey, I think. Martin, would you agree that sort of the act of qualifying for the second consecutive Euros was almost as important as, as reaching the semis in terms of the national confidence. Yeah, I mean, we mustn't forget we, we failed to qualify for a World Cup in between those. To be honest, I think 
the important thing about it about the next few weeks isn't going to be necessarily going to be national competence of the national psyche but what it means to us as individuals it's been a really tough 18 months for everyone in in lots of different ways you know the pandemic has has been a horrible experience and football cheers us up and even if you don't really care about it you know seeing other people happy seeing the news get excited it, you know it puts a smile on people's face so i think at a time where you know we've had 18 months of of the pandemic cultural divisions over brexit you know sport is a rare opportunity to to bring people together to put a smile on their faces to have some fun and you know and that matters more than anything and you don't necessarily even have to win to do that you know so if you can go out in glory um so as long as we have fun i think that that's the important thing uh, you mentioned the World Cup, and I think it's actually quite important. So I talked to Ashley Williams and Neil Taylor probably about two weeks ago now, and they both said one, like qualifying for a second round, you know, it's it's immense. But they were both a little bit let down that they had failed to qualify for that World Cup because they said after Euro 2016, teams started treating them differently on the pitch, off the pitch, everything. And I think it was Neil and then Ash kind of agreed with them. And Neil said that they failed to sort of – accept that challenge they, they really didn't know what to do with that that newfound sort of challenge from the other teams and because of that they didn't get to the world cup and that was supposed to be their next step because even when 2016 was going on with inside the team they were all talking about this can't be a one-off this can't be a one-time thing so world cup that's the next site and then they didn't do it um and both of them said that they were really really let down by that but this next consecutive euros that is the next step and I think honestly, qualifying is such a huge deal. Having got to that point saying, oh, right, it wasn't a one-off, we're here again. They have reached these heights. And we've got 12 players on the pitch who are 23 years old or younger. That's insane. We're, I think we're the third youngest squad in the whole Euros. We've got the 14th most caps. We are, we, are, we are a young, young team. And the fact that we've done this already, we've got seven different goal scorers in the last 13 competitive matches. So we're, we're a different team. I think we're as... As everyone's kind of said, we're, we play a different type of football, but we've qualified for another another major tournament, and right, and we've got sights on a third one. That's that's amazing. Just how important would qualifying for a World Cup be for the nation of Wales? I mean, from just like a purely footballing point of view, I think the Euros are probably a, an overall a better standard of football. But I think the World Cup is the iconic tournament in sport period I think so yeah that that would be absolutely huge and I think and, and I think we'll and I think we'll do it and I think that would be something that would just be not an end not an end point to sort of cementing the kind of the importance of the Welsh football team because I think that's already been done but it would it would take it to another level I think so it would give a whole generation of people incredible moments of joy but it would also give them expectation as to what the football team can do, but also what Wales as a nation can expect as being normal. And it's right and it's correct to see us on an international stage, which I think what I think is really interesting. I don't know if anyone does this. I kind of I enjoy looking at the comments on Nation Cymru articles, just seeing what's being said. One thing that British nationalists will be praying for is that we don't do well. And that includes Welsh British nationalists. They cannot stand to see the Welsh football team do well. They haven't got a problem with the Welsh rugby team, but the Welsh football team seems to really antagonise them and they will be hoping that we don't do well. But we'll see. It's not going to happen, I don't think. The thing about the next World Cup is it's in Qatar. It's, in, you know, it's not in the summer. It's in the middle of the season. It's going to be hot, expensive to get there. A very different atmosphere, a very different kind of nation to France. What made Euro 2016 so great was it was so easy to get there. And, you know, France is such a lovely, you know, lovely country. It was a big holiday. Qatar will be different for the fans. Um, and I think that will take something away from it. But as you know, I totally agree with what Richard just said. As in terms of global profile, the World Cup is a much bigger tournament um, than the Euros. Megan, obviously the World Cup after 2022 is in 2026 is in America, Canada and Mexico. What do you think the American reaction would be to the Red Wall? Oh my God, they love you guys. They would love you guys so, so, so much. I can already see it because I mean, since moving to, to Wales, I've never felt more at home, to be honest. And it's not like home, like the United States. It's just 
everyone here is so kind. They are so inviting. And I think my favorite thing about Welsh football was, I think it was after the game, I put something up like, oh my gosh, I want to be a Welsh football fan. And every single person commented back, well, you, you can be one. Like you can be Welsh if you want to be Welsh. Like, oh my gosh, please come and be Welsh. And in the United States, it's just that positivity that I think we really need and we want and we crave. So no, I think, I think American fans would be, they would be like crying out to be your best friends. So a hundred percent, especially in the South, in the South, we would love you guys. I think you guys would just come onto the front porches, have some lemonade and some iced tea, and we'd invite you over for dinner and uh, it'd, it'd be fantastic. Uh, with all the boring stuff we've been talking about, the politics of it all, we've missed out the most important bit, really. What are everyone's predictions for uh, the game tomorrow against Switzerland and for Cymru for the rest of the tournament. Do you want to start us off, Martin? I don't think it's going to go well. I think he's going to pick the wrong team. Um, I think we'll start slowly and then we'll probably we'll probably lose the first two games and then beat Italy or something stupid. That would be classic Wales doing that. Megan? I think we're going to try out a false nine tomorrow again. Um, I'm very nervous about it, but hopefully with DJ and, and Bale on the pitch, things look a little bit different. Oh, I think we're going to draw tomorrow. But that's me being positive. And I think it's going to be a really, 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 really ugly win over Turkey, thanks to Kiefer Moore. And then Italy is just a giant question mark at this point because I got nothing. They, they're scary. Italy's scary. Rich, obviously you've given all the fans on Podcast Peldroid going to take on what you think is going to happen. But, you know, for the benefit of our listeners, what, what do you think will happen tomorrow and uh, in the rest of the tournament for Wales? Yeah, I mean, I guess I'm intrigued by... Um the formation, as Megan was alluding to there, I think we're going to win. Um, I think Dan James is such an incredibly important player for us now. I think he's I think he's on fire and I think he's going to have an unreal tournament. And I think for those first kind of 20 minutes um, before Nico Williams was sent off against France, him and Bale looked incredibly dangerous. Bale is like a master now of managing his movements, managing space and when to run and when not to exert himself I think he's going to have a huge tournament I think we're going to beat we're going to beat them tomorrow I think probably it'll be a tight game I think maybe 2-1 um, maybe even 1-0 and then and then and we're going to qualify as for kind of beyond that I think it'll be a game at a time obviously that then depends who you come up against but I, I wouldn't I wouldn't bet against us against many teams to be honest so yeah I'm, I'm optimistic well, I just wanted to say, you know, thank you so much, all of you, for coming to talk to us uh, this evening. If people want to find out more from you and hear more of what you've got to say, where can they find you on Twitter? Um, I think I'm just Megan um, underscore Faringa. I think that's mine. I'm, I'm very, very just regular. Um, but you also find me on Welsh Football Fans. I'm the writer on there. So if you go to them, you'll likely see me on there as well. Wonderful. Uh, Richard? Oh, um, best, just Google Richard Owen Roberts. Wonderful, nice and simple. Martin? At Martin Johns, but it's spelled weird because I've got a silent E in my surname. Just be awkward. <laughs> never at all, not at all, never. Um, but thank you once again. Thank you very much for our guests coming to speak with us this evening. If you enjoy what you've heard today on Here I've, please don't forget to find us on Medium and Here I've Blog Cymru, on Facebook at Here I've Blog Cymru, and on Twitter at Here I've Blog. And remember, as Cookie said, Dream, you know, don't be afraid to have dreams. And if you work hard enough, and you're not afraid to dream, and you're not afraid to fail. You know, it, it, everybody fails. I've had more failures than I've had success, but I'm not afraid to fail. Uh, and every now and again, I can't say every now and again because this has never happened to me. But uh, I'm enjoying it. It's sweet, and I think we deserve it. Frank, Gareth Bale, Gobaith Mawr Cymru, Akban Bale, Gareth Bale, you're high Cymru are at Thank you for listening to Hereith. If you like what you heard, please don't forget to subscribe, rate and review.